This is Greg Troutline with Maritime Reporter TV, and we're very pleased to be joined today by George Pesha IV, President and CEO, and Ed Washburn, the Senior Vice President, Fleet Operations for Pesha Hawaii, to discuss the recent build and delivery of George III, a 774-foot container ship designed to service the U.S. mainland to Hawaii trade. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for joining me. And to start us off, can you give a by-the-numbers look at the Pesha Group today using the metrics of your choice? Hey, great. Hey, thank you very much and a pleasure to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about my, my pride and joy, uh, the Patient Group. We're a, a third generation uh, family business uh, celebrating 75 years uh, of business this year. Started out humble beginnings. My grandfather had two gas stations in San Francisco, which kind of formally founded uh, or formed the, the current company. It was probably his fourth career. Uh, my dad joined him in high school and uh, decided that he'd like to do something bigger and different than just uh, gas station work. And so we built basically over about a 50 year period an asset light logistics and transportation uh, company. We started uh, handling uh, new manufacturer vehicles for the OEMs. That was the initial uh, kind of legacy business. And from there, we diversified into brake bulk and other commodities, including um, international forwarding, relocation. And so again, for about 50 years, that was the, the opportunity uh, to diversify and grow in, in spaces that were had synergies between them for the company. Uh, we took a little bit of a different uh, take in about 2000, General Motors uh, encouraged the industry to build a pure car truck carrier for the Hawaii trade lane. And that started our investment uh, and diversification into to shipping. Uh, so in 2005, we delivered the first pure car truck carrier and still the only pure car truck carrier in the Jones Act trade, the Gene Ann, named after my dad's mom. Uh, in 2015, uh, we were getting ready to deliver a second ship, a combination ship for the Hawaii trade lane. We were talking to the folks at the commercial guys at Horizon Lines and those discussions led to an opportunity to acquire the Horizon Hawaii assets and uh, quite a, a leap for us. Uh, but as we kind of culminate that and we're about seven years in, uh, we're quite successfully um, supporting and, and delivering on behalf of the Hawaii trade line. Um, we're super excited to welcome the first uh, LNG powered ship for the West Coast, the George Three, named after my dad. Later this year, we'll, uh, we're excited to, to deliver the second Janet Marie named after my mom. Um, but it's been a, a really interesting adventure. In 2015, that Horizon acquisition just about doubled the size of our company in every way that, uh, that you can measure it from a top line revenue, head count, uh, and EBITDA point of view. And so today, we're as, as we look at 2022, we're a little more than a billion dollars in, in revenue, about uh, 2,000 and, and or 2,200 uh, contributors or teammates that uh, that support the day-to-day -day operation of the business. Um, you know, can you put in perspective for me the importance of ESG to the patient group's business as a whole? You know, I know that the two LNG fueled ships are an obvious manifestation, but I'll assume that there's even more. Um, can you give me a broad overview of how and where the patient group is investing today in regards to ESG? Sure. Well, as a family business, and unfortunately, we, we don't have the benefit of my mom and, and her support, but she was always behind the scenes, very, very proactively um, advocating for the, our team, as well as the communities that, that we have the opportunity to support and work in. So we've always been quite progressive and, and generous in terms of um, contributing dollars, as well as more recently volunteer man hours and, and so forth to support the local communities that we're in. And that, that's really kind of a manifestation of our, of our family values. Um, but we did definitely have uh, more formalized our approach to, to ESG. We formed a little more than a year ago, a committee that includes myself, Ed, other executive um, support, um, as well as staff members that focus quite heavily on, on how the, the company can minimize uh, the impact to the environment um, and the impact to, to the communities. And so that, that opportunity is also further supported now with all of the federal and state grant monies that are coming. And so the group has you know, quite a bit of, of resources to, to look at and compete for, to try and invest in ways that we can really take this to another level. And uh, the, the uh, LNG ships are certainly one manifestation, but we've had the opportunity to pioneer a number of terminal uh, projects 
one that was in the port of, of Los Angeles called Green Omni Terminal um, that started with uh, solar, battery power, electric vehicles, including heavy cargo handling equipment. Um, we were early on, and so we've had some struggles trying to, to make all of that work and pioneer it, but we have the opportunity with some support from Marad grant money to install a microgrid and take that really to a more practical next level as well. So just one example, but working on many, many initiatives across the, uh, the organization to minimize our, our, our environmental footprint, as well as to, to lean in and, and support the communities again from a social point of view. You know, I know that every shipbuilding project has its challenges, uh, particularly a first in the form of George III and its LNG power plant. Uh, when you look at the project now that's in the rear view mirror, what do you consider to be the greatest challenge to bringing this ship from the drawing board to the water? Uh, but the biggest obstacle, Greg, uh, was building a ship uh, during a global pandemic. Um, certainly, it was as close as uh, our ship was built at Keppel Landfells in Brownsville, Texas. Brownsville, Texas is in Cameron County. Cameron County was shutting the shipyard down because at that time, shipyard workers were not essential workers. Through the um, Infrastructure Securities Act uh, and together with American Maritime Partnership, we were able to contribute to that, that act and include shipyard workers as essential workers. So we were within days of the shipyard being shut down uh, really at the middle or start of our project. Um, in addition, uh, most of the equipment is uh, European built um, or Korean built uh, and the restriction on travel and, and just the, the, the difficulty in traveling made commissioning that equipment extremely difficult. I would say that was the largest obstacle. The second is we're the first ship in the United States to be built to the International Gas Fuel Ship Code. Uh, and with that, our U.S. Um, flag state regulators um, are not is not they had to interpret that code um, they interpreted it differently than the international market in some instances um, i think that will get easier as more ships are built in the u.s under that code but we were the first and we felt a little bit of pain on the interpretation on some rules that were different uh, than the international market you know obviously uh, there are a lot of ship owners that are mulling emission reduction and the future fuel of choice. Um, you know, now that you have this experience with this ship, what is your best advice to a fellow ship owner that is considering taking the LNG plunge? I would advocate for it, um, but don't expect it to be easy. Uh, as I explained with the uh, International Gas Fuel Ship Code, um, one of the other challenges, of course, is how do you get fuel and where is that infrastructure? Um, that's always been a chicken and the egg um, type scenario, and I've been uh, at least in the looking at alternative fuels almost my whole career, at least the concept of it. But uh, when it actually happens, um, the, the fueling infrastructure is waiting for the ship and the ship is waiting for the fueling infrastructure. Fortunately, we developed both at the same time. Uh, so we developed a joint venture called West Coast Clean Fuels. Um, Part of our joint venture is World Fuel Services, who delivers 70% of the bunkers in the LA basin, and also Clean Marine Energy, who specializes in, in LNG. Um, building that infrastructure um, and the regulations uh, is different than the maritime regulations. Of course, it's shoreside based. Uh, you do have to include the Coast Guard, but of course, the city and the fire department are involved. Um, it wasn't easy, but it was successful. We've had um, five successful bunkering events already. Uh, and last night was another successful one. Um, so I would say uh, if you want to help your communities and help the environment, LNG is the way to go. It is the only fuel uh, that is capable today of running a high horsepower ocean going vessel um, with an alternative fuel. Uh, but yeah, certainly we're going to pass the 2030 uh, IMO standards uh, by a great deal. Uh, 2050 may be a challenge, but um, it is the right fuel for the future uh, and the only fuel now that is the best available. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, the LNG is the headline of this vessel, um, but what specific technologies can be found aboard George 3 that are geared to uh, minimize the environmental impact? The, uh, yeah, so unique to our vessel is, um, and we, we did put it to all the shipyards in the U.S., but um, we 
we developed some requirements and um, a couple of infills is the only one that came back and said we will start from scratch and design a vessel to meet your needs uh, and i think the insistence of that on our part uh, really uh, helped helps the environment because what we got is uh, today uh, probably still safe to say we have the most hydrodynamic hydrodynamically efficient container ship in the world so our ship went through design computational fluid dynamics for hull form um, that was checked by another group who further optimized it and then that hull form went to the maritime research institute of the netherlands uh, they model tested it and developed a uh, twisted leading edge rudder and a high efficiency propeller to match that hull form during that model testing, we, um, we did add some energy saving devices uh, and they, they were not effective. So it kind of proved to us that we have the most efficient hull uh, that is available. Uh, and in, in use now, we're going 21 and a half knots fully loaded at less than 2% per propeller slip. Uh, for our fleet, that's fantastic, especially we're in headwinds now going to, going to Hawaii. So uh, the results have been terrific. Uh, that with, um, uh, self-polishing copolymer paints. Um, we also, the bridge navigation, uh, the electronics are terrific. Our cross-track error is less than 50 feet as we're going in a straight line to Hawaii. Uh, so we don't have any extra miles. Uh, we have exhaust gas research on the main engine to reduce nitrous oxide, uh, selective catalytic reduction on the auxiliary engines to reduce nitrous oxide. And basically all the equipment is state-of-the-art. It's all um, environmentally acceptable lubricant. Um, so almost anything that can be done uh, was done. Um, our budget was 225 million, but if we had 2.25 billion, I don't think we could have done much more. <laughs> now, you know, I know that this one was just delivered. I know the second one, the Janet Marie is on the way, uh, but do you have plans uh, to order any more ships in the coming 12 to 24 months? We're in the process of converting uh, one of the old 42-year-old uh, steamships and very excited about that. So she's undergoing a conversion. We'll take delivery of her in April next year with an LNG power plant. That will leave us with one more reserve ship to uh, decide whether we're going to invest further and convert that also to LNG or just to diesel. But that debate is ongoing right now. But in the meantime, that basically gets us to where we need to be to support our Hawaii trade lane investment. So I um, mean, just highlight over 20 years that that we've been in, um, including the beginning days of, of Gene and we'll spend just about a billion dollars in both ships as well as terminal and other assets to support that Hawaii trade. So, you know, as a ship owner, as a logistics company, um, you know, what challenges do you see on the horizon? And not to say that the decarbonization or the emission reduction uh, challenge isn't big enough. But what do you see from regulators? What do you see from the market that give you the most cause for concern and why? Yes. So from a, a regulatory point of view, the, the Jones Act trade lanes uh, are unique. I think Asia has been proactive and we've invested smartly, wisely in, in terms of the ocean side of the, of the equation. Uh, we do provide an end-to-end -end supply chain uh, network for our customers. And there, of course, we have warehouses and trucks, um, terminals that are, that are involved in Hawaii. We have the opportunity to, we're in the process together with the state of Hawaii, um, building a brand new uh, greenfield container terminal that will be state of the art and uh, taking the opportunity there to look at uh, renewables on terminal uh, for power uh, regen as well as resiliency. Um, but on the, on the uh, you know, working out our, our main uh, West Coast uh, port and gateway for Hawaii is Southern California. Uh, the state is certainly very proactive right now. Cal California Air Resource Board is looking very hard at how they can encourage all of us as, as users of heavy equipment and whatnot to be as clean and as efficient as we can be. And there we're working together with the state to find a balance in terms of what's really practical and, and how do we get from here to truly a zero emission type of a of a uh, scenario. And there's there's a lot of work there yet and a lot of collaboration needed to, to make sure that we come up with good practical answers in that regard. But um, we're certainly putting ourselves out there and, and trying to do what's what's right and, and uh, help the regulators um, be practical and at the same time uh, drive significant and, and positive difference in that area. Uh, I think um, on the Hawaii side and the ocean side, uh, because we're renewing our fleet, the regulations uh, we will comply with easily uh, for the near future. But I think on the global perspective, 
uh, EEXI and CII is going to cause ships to slow down uh, all over the world. And the cargo is not going to slow down. So it's going to require more ships. So I'm not a true believer that we're going to help the environment uh, with those, those rules because I think we're going to add ships rather than uh, reduce emissions. Uh, you know, it's been a heck of a year for the patient group. Uh, you know, you're celebrating your 75th anniversary. You have uh, new ships coming down the ways. Um, but George, if I can ask, when you look historically at your company, how does your management style differ, differ from the patients that have come before you? Maybe celebrate a little bit what uh, what's what's similar to begin with. And that that is, uh, you know, again, first and foremost, we're a, a family um, business based on fam family values. We've always uh, felt that the, the greatest asset that we have um, is our team and our people. Uh, my grandfather was very hands-on in his service station work. He, he was um, responsible for growing and managing a truck fleet of auto haulers back in the day and was I had an opportunity to intern a little bit in the truck shop, both on the mechanic side as well as helping guys load trucks and whatnot. And my grandfather was very visible, very much a part of uh, the success of the team from the floor plates up and and that's certainly still the case uh, with the company today um, our whole executive team is very close to the folks that are you know again at the floor plates that are really putting themselves out there the essential workers that have worked you know uh, non-stop and tirelessly through this pandemic and and quite successfully so um, which is great both supporting the company financially as well as our customers from an operating point of view um, and I think that maybe the difference, if, if you want to go there, I mean, you know, my dad, my grandfather was a product of the Depression, so very conservative by his nature. Uh, my dad uh, grew up in the 50s and, and maybe an idyllic time. He was much more entrepreneurial and, and aggressive as well. And so he certainly was a great early steward in terms of, of setting us off into the trajectory that we're in now. Um, it's, it's certainly a uh, great and with great pride that we're able to put his name uh, on the stern of, of the George III. Um, we wish he was here. My grandfather would love to, to be in the engine room of the George III and, and, and understand he was an automotive engineer. Um, and again, he would be extremely proud and extremely interested in uh, what's happened over the course of the last 75 years. So um, again, teamwork is, is and, and our team is, is tremendous. Um, and, and so I think our, you know, a lot of consistency there um, and the secret of, of our success.